Okay, so everyone's here. I think we can begin. So, hello, my name is uh, Larry O'Connell. I'm a PhD uh, candidate of University of Grenoble Alp. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about my PhD project entitled um, Optical Bacteriophage Susceptibility Testing by Surface Plasmon Resonance, uh, which is a collaborative project between CNRS, Grenoble, University of Grenoble Alp, and um, uh, CEA Grenoble. And so the experiments took place at SIMS and CEA, and uh, financial support was provided by LabEx Arcan. And before we begin, I'd like to sincerely thank the members of the jury for coming from near and far to, uh, to, to be present at my, at my defense. Okay, so first an overview of the talk. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, the context of the project, uh, why we want to carry out uh, phage susceptibility testing, um, the current methods used, and the approach that we're exploring. Um, but before we can make our biosensors, there are some steps that we need to carry out. There's purification of our phages, and then dealing with spontaneous loss of our phages. This will be covered in part two. And then in part three, we'll be looking at immobilization of our phages. And in part four, uh, then the outcome of the SPR experiments. And finally, a method I explored for um, improving the sensitivity of SPR assays in, in general, in part five. So um, a little bit of context for the project. Um, we're all familiar with antibiotics. Uh, we get sick, we go to the doctor, we take an antibiotic, uh, which helps kill the bacteria that makes us sick, and we get better. However, we've been using antibiotics far too much over the last 70 years, and now there's an increasing proliferation of antibiotic resistance genes in the bacteria that make us sick. And this is called antimicrobial resistance, or AMR. So it's a growing problem that's predicted to cause, to become one of the number one causes of death, with up to 10 million deaths per year by 2050. And so here I've tried to assemble um, uh, some historical and projected death rate data to give an idea of how 10 million AMR deaths compares to other causes. And it's probable that AMR will overtake all of these other causes of death uh, here, so diabetes, type 1 and 2, diarrheal disease, even road traffic accidents, and uh, HIV AIDS. Um, it's going to overtake all of these by, by, by 2050. Uh, so to put a monetary value on that, we're talking about an $80 trillion reduction in global economic activity by 2050, if we don't find an alternative to antibiotics. So that's why phage therapy is being investigated as a plausible, credible alternative. So what is phage therapy? So to explain that, I'm going to give a clinical example, a human example of how beneficial uh, phage therapy can be. Uh, this is the case of a 61-year-old patient that presented with a Pseudomonas aeruginosa infection that was resistant to every antibiotic except colistin. Okay, and so colistin is an antibiotic of last resort uh, because it's highly damaging to the kidneys. It's nephrotoxic. And so after two weeks of colistin, uh, treatment had to be stopped to avoid kidney damage for kidney failure, because you can see these serum creatinine levels of this uh, patient uh, taking off, uh, which, is a, which is a clinical indicator of kidney damage. And so once the uh, antibiotic treatment was stopped very quickly, the Pseudomonas aeruginosa infection returns, of course. And at this point, the patient finds themselves in a position that we all might become more familiar with in the years to come. Uh, antibiotic resistant infection, death is imminent, and there's no antibiotic treatment available. And so at this point, bacteriophage therapy was started. And very quickly, clinical parameters uh, improve, the fever disappears, and the antimicrobial resistant infection is eliminated. So this is an example of a very promising result from phage therapy in a case where antibiotics were no longer an option. So what are phages? Uh, phages are viruses. The viruses that replicate inside bacteria, killing them. And these viruses are harmless to humans. They only kill bacteria, um, which is why the name itself comes from the words uh, bacteria and uh, fa fahin. Fahim from Greek. There's a Greek person in the audience, so I have to get this, this right. Fahim. <laughs> um, and so there are a few different morphologies, and here are a selection of the most uh, studied ones. Um, today we're mostly concentrating on uh, Podoviridae, because uh, that was the, uh, the, one, of the uh, one half of the model system uh, that we're using in this work. Um, and what I'd like to emphasize is the sheer number of these viruses in the environment, because we all know there are a lot of bacteria everywhere in the environment. But what is less known is that for every bacterium, there are 10 times as many phages. Um, so they're the, the largest replicating biological entity on Earth. And in fact, 15% of all bacterial cells on Earth every day are killed by bacteriophages. 
Okay, so really important part of um, uh, microbial ecology. Uh, and so to illustrate this, I found this very nice article where these researchers, they went to um, the lake that was near their, um, near their laboratory. They took a beaker of the lake water, just an environmental sample, um, and they, without filtering it, uh, they just concentrated it and put it into an electron microscope. And what you can see is there are these bacteriophage particles everywhere. Uh, and so there's other things mixed in, there are bacteria, there are algae, uh, all kinds of things, but um, by far the largest component is uh, bacteriophages. So let's look at how they reproduce. So a typical phage is composed of a head containing a genetic payload, a tail that's used to inject that payload, uh, tail fibers that are used to specifically recognize the host cell membrane, and here we have the genetic material. Okay, so that's the structure. And the first step in uh, the lytic cycle involves um, bacteria in the environment, um, and a phage encountering the cell of this host bacterium. And it recognizes the cell surface via these receptors. It binds and injects the DNA payload. And the DNA is, of course, transcribed into RNA, which directs the synthesis of viral proteins, phage proteins. These phage proteins and DNA are then assembled and packaged into new phage particles inside the bacterial cell. And then finally, the phages lyse, they rupture the bacterial cell from within, killing it, and releasing new phage particles to repeat that cycle. And so you can see this lysis very clearly in microscopy. So what we've done here is we've combined a suspension of uh, phages and a culture of its host bacterium, and we've moved them to a microscope. And what you can see is that around the one hour mark, there's this catastrophic uh, drop in bacterial population because of this lytic effect of the, of the phages. Okay, so it's, it's really killed almost all of the bacteria that are present in the suspension. Um, um, and so, there are still these bacterial carcasses, this debris that's left over, which will be um, important later because the, the bacteria are lysed, but they still release a significant amount of biomaterial uh, into this crude phage lysate. So what I'd like to emphasize here now is the narrow spectrum of action that's characteristic of these uh, bacteriophages. Generally, one phage kills one strain or, or a small group of bacterial strains. They're highly specific. And this specificity allows you to target only a specific uh, pathogenic bacterium in the patient's body without disturbing the normal commensal flora, the normal commensal bacteria, compared to antibiotics, which kill uh, almost everything and are quite, quite harmful. So this is at the same time an advantage of phages, but it's also a challenge because we need to choose only the correct phages to introduce into the patient's body. Um, and this is why we need to carry out phage susceptibility testing. And this is what phage susceptibility testing, phage susceptibility screening currently looks like. So a patient here presents at a healthcare facility. Um, with an antibiotic resistant infection. We isolate the pathogen, and then we fill one of these uh, standard uh, multi-well plates, so a standard piece of labware. Uh, we fill it with a uh, liquid culture of um, this pathogenic bacteria. Uh, and then in each well, we add a different species of phage or a different um, concentration of phage. So these are all these candidate bacteriophages, and we want to see which ones are effective. So you put this into an incubator, you wait a few hours, about six hours, and if the phage is effective, the solution will turn clear, okay? Uh, the solution turns clear, or stays clear, because you have this uh, lytic effect of the bacteria that are present. Uh, you have this rupturing of these optical scattering centers. Uh, in comparison, if the phage are not effective, they can't kill the bacteria, the bacteria reproduce, they proliferate, um, they produce lots of optical scattering centers, and the solution remains opaque. So this is an optical signal that you can... Um, you can monitor, and that allows you then to select uh, the correct bacteriophages, in this case, uh, these three, uh, from a pre-prepared, pre-vetted uh, bank of bacteriophages, which can then be made into a cocktail, administered to the patient to kill the bacteria that was making them sick. Okay? Um, the problem is that this is slow. It takes several hours. Uh, it's difficult to scale this up to hundreds of phages for, or for a large number of patients. Um, and what would be best is to have a way of carrying out the same phage susceptibility testing but a more rapid and physically compact assay. And so it's worth at this point quoting the 2018 report in The Lancet on the outcome of the Fagoburn clinical trials, which were these um, um, much anticipated um, clinical trials of phage therapy. If the phagogram duration can be shortened, a selected phage strategy would also be applicable to infections that evolve quickly. So the method that we explored um, is called surface plasmon resonance, or SPR. So I'm not going to go too much into the details of SPR, how it works, but um, just quickly. Essentially, we have a prism, a glass prism, uh, with a thin metal film on top. 
and that's interfaced with a liquid, an analyte. In, in our case, our bacteria are going to be up here. And when the light is incident on this metal dielectric boundary um, here, for instance, for certain angles, you're going to have a drop in the reflectivity. Okay? Because this light couples to collective oscillations of the conduction electrons um, in the metal, forming surface plasmon polaritons. And the angle at which you see this drop in reflected light depends heavily on the refractive index of the dielectric just above the, the sensor surface in the first few hundred nanometers in what's uh, known as the, the penetration depth of the evanescent wave. So what this allows you to do essentially is to transduce uh, physical phenomena, so changes in mass, changes in refractive index, events at the surface, into um, an optical signal that you can then measure. So here's how that, here's how that works. So uh, first we're going to talk about an example of a, a small section of the sensor surface um, that's uh, functionalized with antibodies, because um, we're just going to talk about a more simple system first before we introduce bacteriophages. So in this small section of a, a biosensor, here we've immobilized two kinds of antibodies. An antibody A, which is uh, specific to bacteria A, antibody B, which is specific to bacteria B, and then a control region, which is not functionalized at all. And so um, we choose uh, a single observation angle. We bounce uh, light off the, the underside of this um, metal dielectric boundary. And at this given observation angle, we have a uh, reflectance value that depend, depends on the refractive index above the sensor surface. Okay, and so at sort of time point one, we have uh, this reflectivity here, for example. Um, then, if we introduce a bacterial strain A and we expose it to the sensor, this antibody A, which is specific to it, it's able to bind the bacteria, uh, will bind it, um, which gives us a shift in the plasmon resonance curve because we've changed the um, the refractive index uh, conditions just above the surface in this region. And by monitoring the reflection of uh, the bottom of this region here that was functionalized with this antibody, we can see that there is um, an increase in reflectivity uh, due to this mass uptake, due to this um, binding of bacteria to the surface. And from that, we know that antibody A is capable of binding uh, bacteria A. And then likewise, again, if a second bacterial strain B is injected, the same thing happens again. Antibody B uh, binds to bacteria B. You have a uh, shift in the plasmon resonance curve, and you have uh, a reflectance increase um, in the, at this third uh, stage here. And so um, in each case, SPR has allowed us to measure an event of the surface by observing an optical signal. And SPRI, SPR imaging, involves observing a very large array of dozens uh, or even hundreds of these kinds of functionalized regions uh, simultaneously and in a label-free way. And also in a really physically small package. And so this is the link with phage susceptibility testing because maybe we can replace these antibodies with uh, bacteriophages which we want to assay uh, their, their uh, capacity to bind bacteria. Um, and so if we can replace these antibodies with phages, uh, the sensor response uh, might allow us to choose which phages are effective. And so um, instead of the workflow we had before, uh, which took several hours, the idea is to replace that process with SPR. And so um, how that works is, again, a patient presents at a healthcare facility uh, with an antimicrobial resistant, in resistant infection. Uh, this ba uh, bacterium, this strain is isolated from the patient. And then optionally, there can be a preliminary identification of that strain by using something like uh, Maldatov mass spectrometry, but that's not necessary. What's key is that we then select a, um, a pre-prepared uh, phagogram, um, a pre-prepared immobilized array of candidate bacteriophages, um, which is likely to work against this bacterial strain, but we don't know which ones yet. Um, and then we run the SPR assay down here. And based on the sensor response, we can select from a bank of phages and administer to the patient much more quickly than before the phages that are um, effective at killing this pathogenic strain. So for example, these three phages um, could be selected from this um, phage bank, administered to the patient to cure them of the bacteria that's making them sick. And so um, this really relies on the strengths of SPR because it's a label-free technique and it's a really physically compact uh, form that you're able to carry out these SPR assays in. And you can study binding interactions with a large number of candidate phages all at once and in parallel. Um, and so the hope is that maybe we can do much faster um, uh, this kind of phage susceptibility testing compared to the, the present method, maybe faster than a couple of hours. 
And so the scientific question is, what response will be observed if phages are mobilized on the SPR sensor surface in place of a typical probe like antibodies? So before you can create a biosensor functionalized with phages, you need to purify them, which is far from trivial. So the process of cultivating phages necessarily creates a very large amount of debris, of, of biodebris, which must be separated from the phage before we can, can use them. Okay? So there's a lot of uh, lipopolysaccharides, also known as endotoxin, uh, you have the cytosolic contents, um, you have genetic material, all kinds of biomaterial, ribosomes especially. Uh, you also have flagella, which, the, which some bacteria use to propel themselves, and they're particularly challenging to separate from phages. And all of these need to be separated from the uh, bacteriophages because um, when we immobilize them later on, the immobilization techniques that we use are meant to preferentially immobilize um, all of the smaller contaminants. And what you'll effectively have is a sensor surface that is just um, functionalized with um, uh, biological debris rather than the bacteriophages, which were your target. So I'm going to present a method we were using for the first year of my PhD, tangential flow filtration. Uh, this was a technique that we were using for um, purification of our bacteriophages. And I'm going to explain it first by comparing it to a more common direct flow filtration method, which is this one here. Okay, so anyone who's worked in a lab is familiar with direct flow filtration, or DFF. Uh, so here you have your uh, crude phage lysis. You have your, your phage and all your contaminants um, all mixed in together. And what you do is you, you put this little uh, syringe filter at the end of your syringe and you pass the entire column of liquid across this filter membrane. And you hope that only your phages pass through and all of the contaminants uh, stay here on the other side of the filter membrane because the contaminants are larger than the pore size. Um, and in fact, what happens is that with increasing uh, filtration after even a few milliliters sometimes, uh, what happens is that the contaminants actually build up on the uh, filter membrane in a process known as uh, membrane polarization. Um, and they form, the, form this contaminant gel layer that any bacteriophages that are still in your uh, crude phage lysate have to traverse. And so the effective pore size of your, your filter membrane is, is getting smaller. And all this means that uh, you actually can lose up to about 90% of your phages uh, in one step, in one go. So you're only retaining one tenth of your phages, which is, um, which is not ideal. And so, uh, we explored using tangential flow filtration instead. So this is a tangential flow filtration cartridge. There's a few different brands. Uh, we were using the PAL Minimate. And so the principle of tangential flow filtration puts the filter membranes uh, parallel to the flow of the liquid, okay? And so you have your contaminant and your product um, in a, flu in a uh, microfluidic flow, well, a fluidic flow, which passes through this uh, cartridge. And uh, because it's under pressure, you have um, this filtration effect where the uh, contaminants will pass uh, laterally um, across the filtration membrane. Um, but the key thing is that with TFF, you have this recirculation effect, which we're going to see. So it actually, when it comes out at the end, it is brought back and pumped through again and again and again. And so the effect of that is, even though there will be a gel layer of um, product and some contaminants which builds up um, inside this, uh, this TFF cartridge, uh, the filter membranes are, are repeatedly, continually stripped of um, this gel layer and, and renewed um, by this uh, tangential flow of fluid. And so this is what we had hoped um, to use to cut down on time and cost in the purification of our bacteriophages. And so this is the, the TFF um, apparatus that we were using. There's a lot of tubes. It's, it's, not, it's not so important to understand what's uh, going on. But here's the, the, the TFF cartridge up here. And here's the sample of um, bacteriophage lysate that you want to purify. So what happens is we, we have our sample here. It passes uh, through a peris peristaltic pump, goes into the inlet of the uh, cartridge, and then it's separated because of back pressure. It's separated into um, a product flow, which comes back into the retentate reservoir and then back to the circuit over and over again. Um, and then also uh, it's the second component is the filtrate, which should contain all of the uh, waste. And so uh, this is what we've been using for the first um, year or so um, for purifying our bacteriophages. Um, and then when we uh, compared the results of that to um, more, more typical purification methods, um, the results were a bit surprising. So the way we compared uh, the purification of our phage suspensions was by using a technique called nanoparticle tracking analysis, or NTA. So if anybody is familiar with um, dynamic light scattering, DLS, it's, um, it's some, somewhat similar, um, except um, it's, it's more performant for phage uh, suspensions. 
So the idea of nanoparticle tracking analysis is that you have this very, very thin uh, light sheet, laser beam, um, which is brought into confluence with the focal uh, plane of this uh, microscope. Um, and then you pass a microfluidic flow of uh, any suspension through it. In our case, it was um, our phage suspensions. And what that allows you to do then is to visualize the trajectories of um, any particles that are inside that suspension. So what we can see here is, is actually um, uh, the real uh, bacteriophages that we're, we're looking for. Um, so they're floating along in a microfluidic flow. And so um, we then track the trajectories and then we take advantage of uh, Brownian motion. So Brownian motion is uh, something that was uh, studied quite a, bit, uh, quite a few years ago by Einstein. Um, and there are uh, very good relations between um, the hydrodynamic radius of these particles and um, how fast they move, how, um, how erratic their movement, because larger particles will be more resistant to this bombardment by water molecules, and they will move slower, whereas smaller particles will move more faster and more, more erratically. And so by tracking these trajectories, that allows you to uh, figure out the, uh, the size of the components of your phage suspensions. And so this is better than DLS for our purposes because um, it gives you individual particle information rather than the ensemble average, which is given by DLS. And you also have fewer problems with polydispersity because if you have, if you have a very large um, spread in different sizes of the components of your phage suspension, um, then DLS can have uh, trouble giving interpretable results. So NTA is better for that reason. So uh, we took our crude phage suspension and we purified it by a variety of different ways, ultrafiltration, chemical precipitation with polyethylene glycol, uh, ultracentrifugation, and of course tangential flow filtration that we were just talking about. And then also um, I investigated daisy chaining uh, all three of these and leaving out the tangential flow filtration. Um, and so what we found was, um, I'm going to illustrate, because uh, it, was, it was a whole, a whole load of results, um, it's too complicated to, to present everything. So I'm going to present the, uh, the NTA, the nanoparticle tracking analysis of uh, just two of these suspensions. And so uh, first of all, it's what we um, got out of the tangential flow filtration technique that we were very, uh, we were very optimistic about. I'd like to draw your attention to, to two things that really come out of this, um, this graph. So what we can see here uh, along the x-axis is the, the size spectrum um, and the contribution of particles of that size to the overall population. And what we can see is that there's a very large uh, spike at 65 nanometers, which is what we expect for single phage particles. So fantastic. Uh, tangential flow filtration has allowed us to retain some single phage particles. Fortunately, there's a whole lot of other material in this suspension as well. So what we can see is that while we have a nice peak at 65 nanometers, we also have smaller bumps, smaller peaks at integer multiples of that size. And so what we think that is, is um, aggregates of two, three, four phages and so on. What we can also see is from this orange point cloud, which is another uh, data point which is given out by uh, NTA. What we can also see is that there is um, this uh, contribution to the uh, population in the suspension from lots of different material because the scattering properties are very different. Okay, so what this is basically telling you is that there's some material which is very reflective and some material which is very unreflective. But um, that should be extremely confined if we had just one species, if we had just uh, bacteriophages in our suspensions. And so um, what we finally settled on uh, as our purification technique was this daisy chaining of these um, three purification techniques because what that gives us is, first of all, a really sharp spike at about 60 nanometers, which is exactly what we expect for our um, single uh, monodisperse uh, phage particles. And also we can see that this orange point cloud is showing us that we have um, quite tight control of the kinds of material that are contributing to the, um, the scattering intensity. So what this tells us, these orange point clouds tell us is that the, um, when we use this purification technique, uh, we've really just got um, very pure suspensions of single bacteriophage particles, and they're not aggregated. Um, so that gives you a kind of semi-quantitative um, analysis of uh, the purity of our phage suspensions. And uh, this is to give you a more uh, qualitative assessment. So this is transmission electron microscopy. And we can see here that this is the, the crude phage lysate. Okay, and so this is uh, really minimally processed. Um, so it's, uh, it's got some bacteriophages in there, but it's also got everything else. It's got all of the, the contaminants that we, that we discussed before. And then in the middle here, we've got the tangential flow filtration um, purified samples. And so you can see that's a little bit better. Um, we've got some uh, bacteriophage particles here. So you can see them 
um, the very characteristic of these icosahedral uh, phage capsids. What you can also see is that there's there's a whole lot of other material in there. Um, so you've got um, a lot of proteinaceous material. I think you've got probably a lot of ribosomes, um, but it's very dirty. You can't, you can't do any immobilization chemistry with that. And then finally, uh, this is a highly purified phage suspension, and it's not perfect, um, but it's pretty good. So you can see that there's a lot of um, these icosahedral uh, phage capsids. Um, they may appear aggregated, but that's actually just an effect of the, um, the electron microscopy imaging approach. Um, and so what we have taken from this is that the, uh, the transmission electron microscopy, together with the NTA analysis, is showing that we have uh, successfully found a, uh, a good purification uh, technique. Uh, but then there was a bit of a problem. So um, I noticed that there was this effect where um, bacteriophages, once you've purified them, you put them in the fridge, you put them in a, a, a container, standard labware, and the concentration of your phages starts to drop, and it starts to drop by a lot, by a factor of about 10, um, uh, roughly every day, um, at, at first, and then every week, and so on. And this was very frustrating for me, um, because after purifying my, uh, my bacteriophage suspensions, I assumed that they would stay at the same um, concentration, and this effect actually caused me to, to miss uh, a holiday with family, which I, was, uh, which I was very upset about. And so I wanted to get to the root cause of this uh, phenomenon. And so what I decided to do was to prepare three uh, bacteriophage suspensions, um, very highly purified, and then store them in a bunch of different types of labware. Okay, so this is pretty standard labware. We've got polypropylene tubes, polystyrene tubes, also borosilicate glass, which I conceived of as just a, as a control, which should lead to absolutely no loss of phages, so-called low-binding polypropylene uh, from Eppendorf. I also had this hypothesis that if I could limit the interaction of the bacteriophages with the walls, with the nanotopography of the uh, containers, um, then maybe I could um, stop this effect of um, loss of uh, bacteriophages while they're in, in suspension, in storage. So what I did was I, I pre-incubated the, these tubes with uh, bovine serum albumin, BSA, which is an amphiphilic uh, protein. And so what this is good, is, uh, what this is good at doing is, is um, attaching to surfaces and forming a, a monolayer at first. And so my, my theory was that I would be able to um, use BSA as a protectant uh, to stop um, the loss of uh, bacteriophages in um, storage. And so this was... Um, I decided to do this two weeks before the end of my PhD, which is not the best time to start a new experiment. Um, it took uh, about 2,500 individual drop cast assays. Um, what I was doing was I was uh, measuring the concentration of bacteriophages repeatedly over the course of these two weeks and seeing how they evolved. And that took um, it was about 15,000 individual plaques, phage plaques counted, which, is, which are like individual uh, colonies of phages. Um, and what we found was, yeah, indeed, there is uh, certainly an effect where we lose bacteriophages very, very quickly from suspension. And so the worst performer was glass tubes, in fact. And so you can see that after about, what, two days, we've already lost 90% uh, and then 99% of our phages. So uh, after going to all the trouble of optimizing your uh, purification protocol and then spending a few days uh, purifying your bacteriophages, then uh, to put them in storage and uh, have them um, uh, just be inactivated or uh, yeah, drop out of uh, suspension is, is very uh, frustrating. So um, we were able to uh, show that uh, borosilicate glass is by far the worst and polypropylene, which we have been using, is not that much better. We still use, um, we still lose uh, almost a thousand um, times the, the concentration of bacteriophages because um, this is a logarithmic scale, I'd like to point out. Um, and if we incubate the surface with uh, BSA, I showed that yes, you can uh, you can really limit the loss of bacteriophage uh, from your suspension. So we were happy to be able to um, present this work in, uh, in our paper in uh, Journal of Applied Microbiology uh, last, last month. Okay. So we purified our um, bacteriophages. Now it's time to immobilize them. So I'm going to talk uh, briefly about um, immobilization chemistry. Um, there's a lot of different chemistries that you can use. Uh, we settled on 11 mercaptoin decanoic acid, or 11 MUA, um, which forms this self-assembled monolayer on gold uh, surfaces, which it bonds to uh, using this very strong um, gold sulfur bond. And it crucially presents these carboxyl groups to the suspension, which you can then activate by incubating with EDC and then uh, NHS. 
actually at sulfur one HS we use as well. Sulfur one HS is the same principle. Um, and so uh, sulfur one HS uh, activates the carboxyl groups, um, but it's very um, susceptible to a nucleophilic attack by primary amines. And of course, if you have a protein um, ligand like uh, bacteriophage, for example, there's going to be uh, all of these um, um, primary amines uh, present on the phage capsid. And so what that means is that when you incubate the phages with the surface, um, they supplant the NHS, which is then becomes a leaving group and it's, it's rinsed away. And now you've got these bacteriophages uh, immobilized covalently to the build surface, which is fantastic. And then to limit any um, non-specific binding, you can saturate the surface um, by using ethanolamine because it has a very um, um, very high diffusion constant and it has uh, abundant uh, primary amines on it. And then also BSA again, use BSA a lot. Uh, so BSA will um, hopefully block the surface against um, non-specific binding. Um, and so that was the fruit of a literature review which we had um, published early last year uh, concerning um, all the strategies for surface mobilization of bacteriophage particles. Um, and so what this means is that uh, the point is we can render the surface reactive for mobilization and then we can print an array of different phages on top in order to produce a parallel multiplex multiplexed assay. So this is uh, an example of our automated spotter device which was present in the lab um, before, before I got there. Um, and it's depositing a, a 10 by 6 grid of different uh, phage suspensions in an area of a few millimeters squared, in a process that takes about 45 minutes. So this is, this is the, this the, F, the SPR um, prism that we're trying to functionalize here in the center. And so this we were happy to be able to present at uh, Photonics West, it's BBOS, uh, early last year. Um, and so here we can see one of our prisms at the end of the spotting process here. So you can see this grid has been arrayed on it, and this is what it looks like in surface plasmon resonance, which we'll take a look at a bit more closely later. Um, and so are these phages really immobilized on the surface? Because, okay, we've looked at these diagrams showing the, the, the pretty chemistry where everything works perfectly, but um, are the phages actually being immobilized covalently on the surface? Um, well, it seems so, uh, because what I did was I took a functionalized uh, gold slide and I, cross, I, I cracked it across um, one of these spots. It's not exactly the same idea. This was just a hand, hand pipetted um, bacteriophage suspension onto the surface. But this is essentially the same as the prism surface that's been functionalized with um, bacteriophages. And this is the, the phage functionalized uh, region. And what we can do is with scanning electron microscope, um, we can zoom in onto the surface and we can see these almost spherical objects of the same length scale as what we would expect for 15 nanometer uh, phage particles. Um, and so we have the same result for each of our different phages. And so it seems like, yes, we have indeed immobilized these uh, phages uh, on the surface, because these are, these are individual, individual phage particles. So I'm very fortunate uh, working with um, bacteriophages as my, uh, as my probe, because very often biologists uh, working with um, uh, ligands such as uh, antibodies or aptamers or this kind of thing, they're dealing with probes that are far too small to see. But with bacteriophages, if you use the right um, imaging parameters, you can, you can get these very nice images of them. Um, and so this works for um, all the different bacteriophages that we've uh, tried. So this is uh, the same image again. This is, um, this is a photovirus, which we um, immobilized via 11 MUA. We also tried different chemistries. We tried um, dithiobisocinamidyl propionate, DTSP. Um, which also forms the same kind of uh, self-assembled model there. Um, but this I present because it's a really nice image of a cyphovirus called uh, phage remus. Um, and so it has a different morphology of the protovirus. But I want to attract your attention to the level of detail that we have here, because this is, this is the base plate that's um, quite characteristic of a uh, cyphovirus. Um, and look at, the, look at the scale bar on this. That's 100 nanometers. So this tail tube is just 20 nanometers wide. That's 200 atoms. So it's really, really incredible images that you're able to get out of this uh, scanning electron microscope now. Um, and so we uh, carried out a lot of experiments to find the optimal um, chemistry or just physisorption for a range of different types of bacteriophages. Um, and we achieved better than the vast majority of the literature. So um, there's a lot of information here, but what's important is that um, this is a logarithmic scale and the phage density on the surface that I was able to achieve uh, is in orange. So it's really approaching the geometric limit of how many phage you can pack in onto the surface. And they're also very homogeneous, homogeneous layers with long, long range uh, homogeneity. Um, and so uh, we're hoping to present this uh, in the next 
um, well, coming weeks, coming months. Um, we've submitted that to uh, ACS by Materials Science and Engineering. We're waiting to hear back from them. Um, and on that last point, so I can't say that I've achieved the highest, most homogenous phage density in the literature because one paper uh, by Naidu et al, uh, they claimed 199 phage per micrometer squared compared to our 160. But uh, here are the images that they presented that they were calculating their densities from. So I don't know. <laughs> so I don't know. Personally, I think uh, maybe we achieved uh, near near the highest, at least we can say. Okay, so we've uh, purified our bacteriophages, we've immobilized on the surface, and so now we can progress to surface plasma resonance experiments. So, this is our SPR setup. It's in a temperature controlled enclosure, since the SPR signal is very sensitive to temperature as well. Any temperature swings um, would drown out the signal from uh, mass uptake on the surface. So we have optics here for uh, polarizing and uh, collimating the light from a 880 nanometer LED. Um, and you have, to, um, you have to polarize the light because uh, SPR only happens in the, uh, the transverse magnetic or TM mode. And so the way this uh, optical system is set up assumes a fixed incident angle because uh, we know we're always going to be experimenting on aqueous samples. And so the refractive index will be constrained within a given, a given range, given interval. Uh, but rotating this mirror slightly will give us um, just a little bit of latitude by allowing us to vary the angle, the incident angle slightly, so we can get the best SPR response for a particular, particular sample. Uh, and in the center, uh, we have this SPR prism, um, which has been functionalized with an array of phage particles. Okay, so this is the same thing, but shown a bit more schematically. So here we have a schema of the SPR prism immobilized with um, two identical uh, phage microarrays. Interfaced with a two-chamber cuvette here in, uh, in peak, uh, where we introduce two different bacterial cultures uh, to two identical uh, phage arrays. Okay, and so we wait to see what the response is of the surface to the presence of uh, these, uh, these phages. And so what we find is um, that maybe counterintuitively, um, where you have um, a priori and a specific interaction between a phage and its host, um, where you have a phage that is capable of lysing a bacterial strain, the sensor, in fact, responds slowest and stabilizes to a lower level compared to uh, the other phages in the controls. So um, in each case, uh, the solid line shows where a bacteriophage has been exposed to its host, uh, and the dotted line shows um, as it's a typical response from a bacteriophage that is exposed to um, an off-target, a non-host bacterium. Okay. Um, and so uh, what this shows us is that um, to interpret these uh, results, what you should be looking for um, in this kind of uh, SPR assay is in fact not where the, um, the phage functionalized regions increase in reflectivity the most rapidly, but actually where there is a, a lag. Um, and so this gives us a time to results of about um, 30, 30 minutes. And just to give a kind of an exp a mechanistic explanation for what we think is happening, um, we think that um, at early on in the assay, you have a uh, non-specific phage and specific phage. And so there's, uh, there's a certain response everywhere. Um, and then there is lysis of the bacteriophage, uh, lysis by the specific bacteriophage of its host bacterium. Um, and that's why you get a, a higher uh, signal in the off-target regions, because then you have uninterrupted um, phage um, bacterial proliferation. Excuse me. Um, and then there's always the appearance of um, resistant subpopulations uh, within the bacteria, which we see often. And so while these uh, bacteria are pr proliferating and leading to an increase in the reflectivity signal, um, you start to see the uh, same increase in the reflectivity signal because of this proliferation of um, uh, resistant uh, microcolonies of uh, bacteria. Um, and so that we were able to present in a article just last week in chemosensors. So for the next step, for part five, I wanted to see if I could combine the concept of SPR with a couple of electro electrokinetic effects that I was familiar with from uh, my previous work. So these two electrokinetic effects that I wanted to leverage were dielectrophoresis and electroosmosis, alternating current electroosmosis, but I'm just going to call it electroosmosis. And so dielectrophoresis, essentially what it allows you to do is to attract or repel 
suspended particles based on the conductivity of the medium that they're suspended in and also the frequency of the electrical signals that you apply to electrodes on the surface. Okay? Dielectrophoresis works to attract or repel um, uh, suspended particles and it will always um, attract the suspended particles to the region of highest uh, electric field gradient which is always the corners of uh, electrodes in this case, in this geometry. Okay, so that's dielectrophoresis. Uh, the other effect I wanted to take advantage of was called uh, electroosmosis. And so while dielectrophoresis acts uh, directly on the particles in the suspension itself, um, electroosmosis works instead on the, uh, the fluid itself. So it's, um, it's a movement of fluid which can then, um, through entrainment, through drag forces, um, move suspended particles uh, yeah, through, through drag, through friction. Um, but the crucial thing is that electroosmosis um, works kind of in an opposite way to dielectrophoresis because while dielectrophoresis attracts suspended particles to the edges of the um, electrodes, electroosmosis will always draw the suspended particles towards the center of the electrodes. And uh, for a given frequency range, these two are in superposition. Okay, they're both happening at once, and the balance between them depends on the uh, particular frequency that you apply uh, to the electrodes. So when I decided to try this, there were only two papers that described something similar, except uh, this one used a, a different geometry. Uh, these two papers are from the same team. They're good papers, uh, but they don't have any biofunctionalization of the surface. So they're able to detect there is something above the surface, but there is no biological interaction. Okay. Uh, then, as often happens in, uh, in research, while I've been writing my manuscript, writing my own paper, another paper was published for four hours uh, where they've facilitated interactions between immunoglobulin G, IgG, and anti-IgG using electroosmosis, but not dielectrophoresis. Okay, so I'm hoping to, to build on, on, on that, uh, that prior uh, literature. So this is how that would work. Um, so this is the same SPR prism that you've seen before, but in order to take advantage of dielectrophoresis and electroosmosis, we need to be able to pattern these interdigitated electrodes into, into the surface. Okay, so interdigitated electrodes, uh, they don't touch each other. They're, they're like two combs that are, uh, well, yeah. interdigitated. Um, and so there's no short circuit between them. Okay? And so the, the electros, electrical signals that we apply is going to be between alternating electrodes. Um, the way I designed them was to be backwards compatible with the SPR devices that we were already using in the lab. So you can see here it's, um, it's set up in just the same way as the SPR prisms we normally use, but now you've got this interdigitated electrode array um, and you've got these electrical contacts out there for applying the signals. So uh, more schematically, what we hope to do is to use, first of all, dielectrophoresis at about 100 kilohertz to attract bacteria from the surface, from the solution, and bring them onto the surface. Okay, and once they're there, we can change the, the signal frequency to about 10 kilohertz, where electroosmosis dominates over dielectrophoresis, and then you have um, the bacteria which are being dragged across the surface to the interaction zone where they can interact with uh, these immobilized ligands, these antimicrobial peptides. So that's how we want to use these electrode arrays. Um, and so to simplify the system, rather than using phages as before, we just concentrated on a more simple ligand, a more simple set of probes, uh, which were antimicrobial peptides. So rather than introduce two novel aspects at once, phages and electrokinetics, we explored something that had been demonstrated by previous work in the lab, uh, these antimicrobial peptides, and we explored if the patterned electrodes were at least compatible with biosensing. Um, the problem is, uh, typically, patterning a uh, gold surface would take several hours. You'd have, need to use lithography, uh, which involved a clean room, harsh chemicals, special training. And this adds up in terms of cost and time. Okay, And so I didn't have a lot of time to dedicate to this because it was a side project of my PhD. So I looked for a way to pattern these surfaces uh, more rapidly. And what we found was that we were able to adapt a printed circuit board uh, prototyper, um, which is based on laser ablation. Um, and what this this machine is normally used for is prototyping these uh, printed circuit boards, um, electronics, um, but with a length scale, characteristic length scale, which is much larger than the electrode arrays that we need to produce. Um, but we found out that, um, uh, myself and my colleague uh, Bryce Poirier, we found out that by um, pushing the limits of this device and playing around with the, um, the parameters, the, the patterning parameters, we're able to actually uh, get very good results um, in patterning these electrode arrays. 
And so in comparison to the, the hours long process of producing a normal, um, of carrying out the normal lithographic steps or lift off processes to produce electrode arrays, um, I'm going to show you the entire process for uh, producing them by laser ablation that we uh, developed. So let's start there now. That's it, 12 seconds. And what we get out at the end, uh, we can see in uh, scanning electron microscopy, uh, the results are pretty good. Um, so there are some artifacts that are left behind where you have uh, molten metal which resides on the surface. So this, is, this is our first couple of tries, but already you can see that we've uh, managed to get these 15 micrometer thin um, uh, electrode uh, fingers compared to a human hair, which is about 100 micrometers. Um, and so then by optimizing the parameters successively, so we iterated this, this process with a few different um, uh, parameters, a large, a, large different, uh, a large number of different combinations, we were able to uh, finally arrive at um, these 85 micrometer wide uh, electrodes uh, interspaced with 42 uh, micrometer spaces. And so um, this actually turned out to be very well for uh, the electro trapping experiments. And so this is, this is a real SPR prism which is uh, developed by um, this process. Okay, and so uh, I carried out some finite element analysis in COMSOL just to make sure that these, uh, this geometry would be able to uh, track the bacteria. Um, so just to show the simulated region in context, um, it's a slice through a volume that's just above uh, the, the, the region above the, um, the electrode array. So here we've got gold and here we've got glass. So um, I initialized the bacteria with two conditions. Um, so I initialize them with, uh, with a given velocity, so it's a, it's a run and tumble uh, motility that I've simulated. And on the left, uh, they're initialized with no dielectrophoretic signal applied. And on the right, they're initialized with dielectrophoresis. And what you can see is that quite quickly, uh, within a couple of seconds, uh, the bacteria are attracted from the surface and there's a depleted region um, from the first tens of micrometers of the surface. So what that is allowing us to do is to facilitate interactions between these bacteria and what is on the surface. For a given bacterial concentration, you're going to get far more interaction between bacteria and what's on the surface compared to just random bacteria bumping into the surface as we have. We don't have any electrokinetic signal applied. And so we wanted to test uh, then if um, reality matches theory. So we developed this um, microfluidic flow chamber which just um, partitions the bacteria um, quite uh, homogeneously across the interdigitated electrode array. Um, and then we can look at it with optical microscopy and we can see if um, we can trap them on the surface. And it seems like we can. So uh, two things to pay attention to here are the frequency that is applied and the behavior of the bacteria. What we can see is that right away at about uh, between 100 and 200 kilohertz, the bacteria are attracted to the edges and then by reducing it down to 10 kilohertz, you shift that balance between dielectrophoresis, bringing them to the corners, and electroosmosis, bringing them to the center. And by shifting that balance, you can move the bacteria to the corners and into the interaction zone. Okay. Um, and so uh, this is the uh, setup. So this is a standard um, SPR setup, a standard SPR um, oven. Um, and the way I conceived of it, uh, it is compatible, backwards compatible with the SPR devices that we've been using in the lab. So I hope that can be developed in the future. Um, and so what we can see is that uh, these antimicrobial peptides, they do indeed uh, seem to interact with uh, the bacteria when they're injected at increasing concentration. You can see this increase in the, in the signal, um, these uh, antimicrobial peptides after the sort of electrokinetic uh, pumping effect. And so uh, we can see this, uh, this difference in signals uh, in about 10 minutes after um, we carry out this pumping. And so we're hoping to publish that uh, quite soon. Um, there's a few of us here in the room who are uh, co-authors on that paper, so we're uh, hoping to get that uh, published in the coming weeks. So just to summarize, um, we designed a new type of doubly functionalized sensor, which is not just um, uh, chemically, biochemically functionalized, but also uh, physically uh, functionalized. And so we improved on uh, the prior literature, uh, improved on the work of Costella and Avanas by facilitating interactions between bacteria and a functionalized uh, sensor surface, functionalized with these antimicrobial peptides. Um, and we also improved on other work by using um, dielectrophoresis for concentration of the targets as well. 
Um, so that just brings me to the conclusion on Outlook. So um, in terms of purification, we developed a high performance phase purification method. Um, we achieved among the highest, or maybe the highest, uh, phage surface density. Um, then we investigated the root causes of the uh, loss of phage um, and then proposed a strategy to uh, mitigate it. Uh, we demonstrated uh, SPR proof of concept. Um, and then we demonstrated electrokinetic mass transport and uh, very rapid um, uh, fabrication and prototyping of the interdigitated electrode arrays. Another aspect of the PhD which I wasn't able to get into was um, exploration of lens-free and phase imaging methods to achieve the same objective um, of rapid phase susceptibility testing. Um, so in terms of future, future work, um, the SPR technique for phase susceptibility testing is, uh, the analysis is quite delicate. Um, it necessitates covalent immobilization of the um, bacteriophages onto a solid surface. So there's a big question mark over whether these bacteriophages are going to behave the same in vivo, which is what we're interested in, as they behaved um, when covalently immobilized to a surface. So that needs uh, further work to, to validate. Um, we should also concentrate on larger arrays of phages because the, the, the motivation for this, uh, this, this PhD is to demonstrate a technique that can be extensible to many dozens or hundreds of uh, bacteriophage candidates. Um, we should also look at mobilizing different phage uh, morphologies because uh, while we looked at uh, Podoviridae, um, there's also uh, Inoviridae and Myoviridae and Cyphoviridae, uh, which are, are, are quite typically seen in the, in the literature as well, especially for especially Myoviridae. Um, in terms of the electrokinetic SPR, um, they were designed to be backwards compatible, so they should work with all of uh, the SPR devices that we have in our lab. Um, and so with minimal, with minimal uh, time spent, uh, these should be able to be incorporated into any, any experimental um, work that would benefit from electrokinetic mass transport. And also the laser ablation method um, allows for really quick fabrication of these prisms with no extra, no extra equipment or consumables um, and no uh, real specialized training. So I'm hoping that can be developed. Um, and then, of course, back to the lens-free and phase imaging microscopy methods that might provide a faster and even, yeah, even faster and more simple alternative to SPR to achieve the same objective. Um, and so we have a patent application pending for using uh, lens-free techniques for achieving the same objective of uh, phage susceptibility testing. So in terms of publications and conferences during this PhD, we've had um, quite a few papers that uh, came out of this. Um, including uh, the first author uh, with uh, Prisco for the month, uh, who's here in the audience as well. Um, and we have a couple of uh, papers uh, which are still under review, and of course the uh, patent application, which, uh, which we're hoping to, to get. That'll be a few months to a year from now. And so with that, I'd just like to, uh, to, to acknowledge all of the people uh, that have made this PhD possible, especially my uh, director de thèse, Pierre Marcoux, my co-supervisor, Ivan Rupiaz, uh, thank you very much for always being uh, always being available and uh, for endless uh, corrections. Um, here I am with the, the team of uh, Crayab, a couple of different photos. Um, I'd like to thank everybody I've uh, worked with there as well. And then there's, uh, there's, a, there's a long list of people who, I've, uh, who I wouldn't have been able to carry out my work uh, without, in, uh, both in CEA and, uh, and further, further afield. So with that, I'd like to uh, thank you for your attention.